I would like to know the audience a little bit and uh, just to have a little show of hands would be nice. Uh, so how many of you are, let us say, outside of Kerala, just to know? Okay, quite a bit, okay. Thanks for coming uh, all the way. Um, then uh, how many of you have uh, taken some course on parallel computing or have written a parallel program already? Okay, some of you, that's good. And uh, how, of you, how many of you think you are a computer science person um, as opposed to a non-computer scientist, like an atmospheric uh, science person or a mechanical engineer? So how many truly computer science kind of people here? Okay, and how many domain scientists, uh, such as atmospheric science or mechanical engineering? Okay. We have a broad mix of uh, folks here, and uh, this is the interesting aspect of uh, high-performance computing. I personally found my way into this area through uh, various um, involvement in, involvements uh, in terms of software debugging and testing. So what I have observed is that nobody really uh, begins uh, being a high performance computing person. There is some force that uh, drives one forward. So I think it's uh, 10.30. I should have enough material for uh, one and a half hours. Uh, let us see how it goes. Uh, generally, I believe in making sure that the basics are covered well. And um, if you have any questions anytime, please uh, show hands. Either I will address it uh, in a brief manner, or if it is uh, important to discuss it at length, we can make a note here. Okay. All right, so few items of uh, history which have already been touched. Um, so again, uh, I'm here because of all these uh, professors who uh, taught in this very building, and uh, I already told you that uh, many of them were in electrical engineering, others in civil and math. Um, all this has been covered, but I would like to point out some of the fortunate influences along the way. Uh, Dr. V. Rajaraman, he is regarded as uh, the father of computer science in India. If you did not know him in that capacity, you should really think of him in that capacity. He was a professor for me at IIT Kanpur. And then after finishing my MTech there, he kindly took me on as a research assistant where I was instrumental in setting up a microprocessor lab for him. So we ordered Chrome Co computers from uh, Palo Alto and uh, I even went to Delhi to get customs cleared and things like that. And, uh, the long story short is that some of the microprocessor efforts in India were there. And Professor Rajaraman did set up uh, a DEC 10 computer at IIT Kanpur and subsequently moved to IAC Bangalore. He's retired now. And so people like the, them really moved this nation towards uh, what it is today in computing. <coughs> okay, so I am also, uh, I also mentioned uh, Dr. Jairaj's role in uh, having me here. So hope to continue that uh, collaboration. Uh, and I'm also very much looking forward to the uh, interactions with the NVIDIA and uh, Intel scientists. So the rough plan is for me to address the basics today. There is going to be a lab session where we will install some of the software, get uh, set up. Uh, so again, uh, there uh, it'll be good to have show of hands kind of surveys Professor uh, Jairaj will conduct. So how many of you have uh, used uh, Linux or Unix uh, before? Okay, quite a few of you. Uh, we are going to address uh, everyone's needs, so don't uh, worry if you are not uh, in any of these groups I'm calling out. So there will be uh, sessions where we help you through Linux and uh, things like that. Okay. So Utah, Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay, this is a picture of uh, from downtown Salt Lake. If you project down towards the mountains and sort of uh, magnify both, um, in reality, if you are in the city, it doesn't look uh, mountains don't look this close. But it's a ski resort. It's where um, the 2002 Winter Olympics were held. Uh, if you are in Salt Lake City in a year, you would end up skiing, which I do, uh, things like that. Um, people eat strange things in Utah. They call them, uh, this is a gelato, a gelatin that they like as a dessert. Uh, the local community is uh, largely Immigrants from 100 years ago, sort of Scandinavian origin, so they came to follow this uh, religion, a brand of Christianity called Mormonism, uh, and uh, many of them uh, are, are from Europe or all over the world assimilated. It's a greatly vibrant international atmosphere there. 
there is one device that we all use that got invented in Salt Lake City. Uh, uh, can you believe what it is? Any, any ideas what that is? <laughs> it's not a birdhouse, although it looks like that. Okay. So it's the first traffic light, at least in North America, was uh, uh, invented in Salt Lake. I cannot claim that we are the inventors of tra traffic lights because pr probably people are thinking of this, but at least uh, as far as recorded history goes, this device was planted in mid uh, downtown and people are operating it by hand and uh, things like, there are stories like that. But Utah and Salt Lake City is uh, famous for uh, having a computer science department that is pretty influential in computing. Uh, this was a drawing of the internet uh, as of uh, 1968 or so, where we were the fourth node of the ARPANET, and this was the whole internet at that point. And uh, somebody drew that diagram on a napkin, that's what we have. Subsequent to that, uh, we managed to hire some very illustrious faculty, uh, uh, Dr. Ivan Sutherland, uh, who is a Turing Award winner. He developed a system called the Sketchpad, which is the first uh, interactive graphics, uh, pen and uh, display oriented uh, unit for doing computer aided geometrical design and uh, that was done in the early 70s. And as a result, computer graphics was pretty much invented in Salt Lake, you can say. So Ed Catmull of Pixar, he was a PhD student there, uh, uh, Jim Warnock of Adobe Corporation. So many of the uh, companies that we founded have been transferring um, technology to the graphics industry and hence uh, high performance computing industry to some extent. Then, uh, as you know, NVIDIA is uh, one of the leading companies in parallel computing. And uh, since we have maintained the graphics tradition, we have a lot of our students uh, go to NVIDIA, become top researchers, and uh, there's a healthy uh, dialogue between them. So cur currently, so one of my PhD students, Vinu Joseph, he went to NVIDIA uh, last summer, this, uh, re uh, just uh, two months, three months ago and developed a way to take neural networks and uh, trim it down so that it is more energy efficient and yet does uh, face recognition, things like that very well. So we have dialogues with companies. Okay, so you're not here mainly to hear the history, although you would like to know a little bit of where I come from and uh, what all I can, what else I can talk about. Okay. So I'm going to make this a uh, little dialogue in terms of what we all need to do to make high performance computing reliable, approachable in a tangible, teachable way and make steady progress uh, in making some of the software design problems in this area uh, get ameliorated or be get better. But if you take a snapshot of high performance computing, what we see are these extremely large supercomputers um, deployed in various national labs and each country is trying to shoot towards a certain speed mark or a milestone. They call it the exascale speed mark or exascale performance uh, uh, objective, uh, 10 raised to 18 floating point, excuse me, <coughs> operations. Um, they run a, a standard program called LINPAC and they measure how much speed LINPAC achieves uh, in uh, running it on a certain supercomputer. That gives you a certain yardstick. It's not the best yardstick for, say, uh, now knowing the speed for a graph algorithm or a molecular dynamic system, but all these things are uh, ways to measure how we are doing. So in that sense, countries are uh, exceeding each other in terms of compute capabilities and uh, governments are putting in effort what we see are a whole set of hardware and software entities all playing together. And it's important to understand how hardware has helped uh, propel this area forward, how software has uh, propelled this area forward. So that's what I'll be trying to address in this talk. So I list here some names. Um, MPI is one of the names so that will come up naturally in my talk. I don't need to address it, but it's called message passing interface. So what I had listed up from here to here are roughly uh, programming languages or programming models, some of which, or all of which will be uh, covering in this course. Charm++ is a model that uh, makes some of the uh, dynamic asynchronous parallelism uh, happen more easily. We will not cover that. 
We will be briefly visiting the UINTA framework, which is one of the state of the art frameworks at Utah, but that will be towards the end of the uh, lectures. This list was not sorted in any particular order, but uh, they include some of the components we'll discuss. Some of these are runtimes, where it's like an operating system which supports the services needed for a compute application. So what we really see are names that you are not used to if you are in a big data community or a MapReduce community. Software components are differently named, libraries are different. So it is this that uh, defines what a user sees in terms of high performance computing. And uh, the explosive growth of high performance computing is finally used to manage uh, the world, I use it in a literal sense because um, almost all discoveries in science and engineering and um, uh, anything that needed busy d designing physical gadgets and breaking it, it can now be done on a computer. What can go wrong? Well, uh, let me begin with some uh, thought-provoking slides and uh, how researchers are doing in the short amount of time, that's what I can do. So this uh, crater was formed, uh, not by a meteorite hitting, but uh, an actual truck carrying high explosives overturning about 40 miles from where I am. And uh, the driver could run in time, so he was saved. But uh, it had a huge 16,000 kilograms of high explosives, it just went up. So it left this big crater. So what uh, one of the groups in my department has been doing is to understand how explosions uh, happen and how explosions can be contained. So they took it as an opportunity, and then they modeled the particular phenomenon that actually occurred in nature. They literally studied the arrangement of the explosives, how fire and uh, charges propagate. So this is the UINTA system that has been used, and they have written some papers in this area. So this is just one glimpse of what high performance, high performance computing is done uh, to design real artifacts. And uh, what, what is involved is a complex set of uh, physics and uh, chemistry reactions that need to be modeled at an affordable rate and a scale. Then you need uh, the right computational framework and all that. Yeah, one of these uh, is, uh, yeah, these are my colleagues. Uh, I, don't, I don't see my student uh, listed here. Okay. But HPC has made this spectacular advances. Uh, how did it all come about? It's good to rewind the history a little bit. Again, the reason to make these courses uh, a deliberate attempt at understanding history and basics is that we cannot hope to understand everything about computers, uh, high performance computing over this short time I'm here. But whatever I do should have some long term impact in our minds. So this is the goal and I, I'm a strong believer in uh, sowing some seeds of thought about history, what goes on behind the covers and things like that. So you'll see some of these attempts on my side uh, to delve into the basics a little bit more. So if you followed high performance computing in the 80s, you would not have heard of any of the machine types we are hearing about now. It was really hero effort by single people who tried to make a large, uh, exp uh, very complex machines all by themselves. So Seymour Cray, how many of you have heard of his name, Seymour Cray? Some of you, and it kind of reflects our age also in a sense, because uh, those who have uh, been around longer knew about him, uh, but the youngsters should know him also. He actually designed this uh, circular arrangement because the wires had to be extremely short, <laughs> that was his thinking. And this uh, nice uh, platform-like uh, thing that was not a seat for people to sit on, there, so they were the power supply. Maybe we could sit on it also, a nice warm seat, <laughs> why not? And then he had, uh, a tall uh, um, uh, person and a short person wire up inside, they were dropped in and things like that. He had used to build uh, supercomputers using gallium arsenide technology, which was the fastest at that point. So CMOS and gallium arsenide were going neck to neck, and at that point, gallium arsenide was a bit higher. Uh, he, he used uh, vector supercomputing as the mechanism. So that's one of the takeaway points here, okay? Vector supercomputing. This is a f form of parallel computing that exists in a lot of machines even today. So parallel computing is not a singular attempt to parallelize a piece of program using message passing or shared memory or GPUs, but parallelism happens at all the levels. Even if you build an adder, there is a lot of parallelism inside an adder. And uh, adders do carry speculation, so the two chunks of the addition can 
go on in parallel, gates are parallel, so we cannot ignore the amount of parallelism that is in hardware. In fact, hardware is uh, the seat of the highest amount of parallelism. But one level up, we are trying to take loops, program loops, and trying to make all the loop iterations go at once in parallel. So wide vector unit comes into play. That's what uh, picks up the entire loop worth of instructions and the loop lanes compute. And that is really come back uh, into be, to be present in all microprocessors now. Vector supercomputing is something we take for granted, but uh, when you write a piece of code and compile with the right vector instructions, it really gets bound to the vector units. So, and if you do not turn on vectorization, or if you do not write loop in such a way that it vectorizes easily, you, the performance will not be as high. Anyway, so this was a single push at that point, and he achieved a fair amount of supercomputing through that. Um, the technology curves go up and down all, the, all over the place. So this uh, Cray-like approach to building supercomputers is not scalable. It's a single person building very expensive machines with a few customers. So we need to commoditize uh, supercomputing. So how did that happen? So again, uh, the other technologies that happen along the way really help you. So Linux was happening at that point. Linux is a great moment where it broke out from the main Unix branch and made operating systems, everybody's uh, little uh, plaything. So Linux Torvalds was very instrumental in making Linux moment happen. And as soon as Linux happened, everybody could boot an OS. And as soon as that happened and you had workstations, somebody had the idea, uh, Tom Sterling in this case, he said, let us buy a lot of simple commodity boxes and connect them together to form a Beowulf cluster. Uh, the name comes from some historical uh, story I don't really remember. That aside, it actually broadened the supercomputing market and started other movements in our area, such as message passing based uh, parallel computing. So this is the time in which now the computation is not happening inside a single CPU core or anything with vector additions happening, but different boxes. So you need a good library to glue together, uh, send and receive messages across the boxes. Sometimes you need to do a collective operation on a collection of data. So this message passing interface MPI library happened uh, around that time also because the, they served the needs of each other. MPI is a library that was created by very enterprising and pioneering figures. I know uh, all of them really well. Uh, William Grob, Rusty Lusk, uh, Rajiv Thakur, a few others. They set out with the idea that this library should be adopted by each and every company so and uh, academic institution. So they made the library in such a way that it had a lot of calls. It had an excessive number of calls. So in many libraries, we think that it should have 10 functions, 15 functions, and that's an easy to understand library. Um, you can make a library easy to understand even if you have 200 functions. So MPI began that way, lots of functions. But the nice thing is that for each application writer, they care about six or seven of these functions. So if you are doing a certain kind of FFT algorithm, you'll care about certain functions. If you are kind of doing map reduce, you'll care about others. And these uh, functions were all optimized based on the hardware platform that was underneath. So that's the nice thing. You can make uh, MPI send receive operations uh, uh, extremely efficient, uh, things like that. And again, you can see the history of these uh, uh, libraries. They were born when uh, the world's fastest CPU was uh, uh, running at 68 megahertz. Uh, what's the clock rate uh, you have heard of uh, uh, that far? What's uh, the cutting edge today? What's the highest frequency you have heard of? A any numbers? <laughs> hmm? 2.6, yeah, it's 2.6 gigahertz. Yeah, it's all now in the gigahertz range, yeah. Yeah, but you don't see too many exceeding five gigahertz, uh, hard to see that. Uh, there, so there are some reasons we will look into. So around, we are in the gigahertz ballpark now. Yeah. And the internet had this many sites, and it's still the most dominant library. MPI has become, uh, gone through MPI 3, which is slowly getting adopted, and MPI 4 is in the design board. Well, there are other developments also that made the parallel computing happen. But again, the time it takes for ideas to penetrate is enormous. So Charles Lysersen in the late 1990s 
it's them itself observed that parallel computing is an inevitable uh, general purpose need. People cannot avoid parallel computing. So they, they were pioneering figures, but his ideas were largely confined to MIT and they were able to write a uh, dialect of C and they called it silk. Um, they had other functional language dialects also, but instead of calling a function in C, they said, how about spawning the function? So spawn means that function call detaches itself from the parent as if it's an independent function and then you can join with it later. So that model was created for the first time by Charles Leiserson. And he also invented this idea of work stealing, which we will be seeing in the threading building blocks later. Work stealing is the idea that all these functions may call sub functions and they create their own spawn commands. So in effect, all these functions are creating their own work items. But then the question is if one function creates an excess of work, should that core in which CPU node in which this work is getting created do all the work itself? But that's not a good thing, right? Because uh, there is an issue of load imbalance. If all the work is bottlenecked in one core, then that core is going to be the uh, choke point. So this idea of work stealing was invented again. So the idea is that you creator of a work can push a work into its own little queue or double-ended data structure. And if it gets free, it can pull back its own work and execute. But some other idle core can take it from behind and execute it. That's called work stealing. And the work stealing was arranged in such a way that uh, the thief work, the person that steals the work has to pay a little bit more price to steal the work than a creator taking the work itself. That arrangement was made because uh, you wanted a certain threshold to be met before work stealing became effective. So I'm putting all these thoughts into your mind just because A, it is important to know it historically, and B, we may not see some of these uh, details unless uh, we do advanced parallel computing. But you will, I'm sure, in your uh, life encounter these ideas at some point saying, what is work stealing? Why is there an asymmetry between producer and consumer in work stealing? Things like that. And all these are central ideas uh, in shared memory parallel computing. And Guy Blalock, another Carnegie Mellon, uh, professor also uh, uh, was a pioneer, but their ideas were not adopted by the industry. The industry was still playing the old Intel game of making extremely deep pipelines, 32 stages, 40 stages, extremely uh, deep pipelines, trying to get the most instruction level parallelism out. They were really not really going to change the programming model at all. You could still write sequential code and hope to get parallel. Free lunch, you know, <laughs> the free lunch. But the inevitable disaster did strike all companies around uh, 2002, 2003. The CPUs uh, started, stopped getting faster. Clock frequency scaling became impossible. Power consumption of chips uh, started growing quadratically. And uh, the industry usually has to be hit with disasters, otherwise they don't take action. So again, I was visiting uh, Intel Texas at some point where my colleague was working on this Tejas microprocessor and very soon he told me that Tejas is canceled. So his entire sabbatical work was thrown away. And of course, this was uh, a big news item. So New York Times published an article. They just could not deliver a microprocessor that could be used in an affordable package. You had to use special cooling technology and special packaging, which would meant the workstation should have been thousands of dollars more costly. And um, that, that is the end of the Moore's Law. This is also known as the end of the Moore's Law, although Moore's Law is really only talking about the number of transistors you place on a chip. It's really not placing transistors alone, but uh, other things had to happen around Moore's Law. That, that's what end of Moore's Law really says. Um, the idea is that if somebody plotted, and in, in fact, this plot was produced by some folks in this article, they start, started observing that the industry was unable to produce chips exceeding a certain frequency. And there was a time when increasing the frequency was the main game uh, used to increase performance. So alpha chip was the first one to run uh, at uh, a, fair, a fairly high clock rate. Um, if I, my memory is correct, it is uh, close to a gigahertz, I forget it. But see, these were expensive design ideas. But they couldn't afford to do that anymore. 
and then they started knowing uh, what the heat of these processors would be if you continue beyond the power density. So high performance computing is a area where energy is the currency, energy is real dollars and or rupees and uh, energy is used to govern how much affordable, uh, how much computing you can do. So today we can reach exascale. There's no, nothing that prevents us from getting exascale even today, except we'll have to uh, build, uh, we'll have to spend about in US dollars at least $100 million a year to power it up. Because one megawatt equal to $1 million a year. <laughs> That's roughly it is, how it is. So exascale computing becomes a national prospect where taxpayers uh, will fund an exascale computer only if it can be capped within uh, 25 million dollars US equivalent or e same money goes for Indian electricity rates also. So it's all a matter of energy uh, trade and performance trade-off. Yeah, so I will take you through some of the details. It's Im in, in, in important to appreciate some of these nuggets. The main source of energy dissipation in a microprocessor is because you are charging transistors um, gates and then when the uh, polarity of the input changes, you're discharging. So you're charging and discharging each transistor. The transistors are extremely small, they have extremely small gates, but nowadays you have about 10 billion or 15 billion transistors. Uh, in microprocessors there are less than 10 billion, let's say, transistors. In GPUs, you have some of them having 20 billion transistors. So the numbers add up quickly. And so if you have more transistors, you are increasing the gate capacitance. Is the activity factor, how much are you switching the transistors? Uh, so if you're switching them with a duty cycle of 0.5, activity factor is 0.5, total capacitance. Square of the voltage, and so the vol higher voltages simply kills uh, performance and frequency. And voltages are pretty much dictated by how much, how low you can operate a chip in terms of voltages. So Dennard's law is another law that uh, explains how electronics works. Um, various factors have prevented gates of uh, chips, uh, transistors from operating below 1.1 volts or close to one volt. That's about where it stops. And even if you operate a transistor at that, at that, that lower voltage, other effects start coming in, leakage. Leakage currents uh, play a role. So more than this uh, activity, uh, the AC V square F happens. I cannot give a complete picture of the whole thing. The chip power used to be switching alone, but switching plus leakage is uh, what is governing. But you, you, you have a certain take away from some of these slides that tells you what, what all factors weigh in. So let us summarize some of these details at a high level because we have a lot to learn. Let us see how certain industrial uh, pioneers have viewed it. So some pioneers are like Bob Colwell, he says, Moore's law was something that says to every two years, uh, t twice the number of transistors. Dennard's law at that point, all those complex equations aside sort of meant uh, Transistors will become faster and lower energy as you shrink them. Um, this is what a transistor looks like and uh, comparable to size of uh, certain viruses that infect uh, tobacco leaves, tobacco mosaic viruses. So extremely small and still getting small. But around 2005, this law that transistors will become faster and low energy uh, didn't hold. So you just had to use transistors uh, grudgingly and uh, transistors were not as energy efficient. Um, the general view one can take is that this was the olden days uh, when we were trying to make uh, transistors uh, smaller so the net capacitance on a transistor's gate went, went down, voltages came down, but if the frequency kept increasing, uh, there is a heating problem there. Uh, that's another takeaway take about why we must go parallel, um, but that's coming in another slide. Okay. So try to understand this area. Okay, I'm, I'm only giving you some data points. Uh, this is another cartoon that tells you what, what is going on with microprocessors. 
uh, instead of a single core that burns a uh, high amount of energy, you have lots of cool, cool uh, heads working in parallel. Um, let me give you one more uh, tangible metric that I really found uh, easy to understand. So Ed Grosowski, who at, at Intel studied how transistors and uh, processors in general use energy. So he tabulated it in the following way. However you implement a microprocessor, uh, and if you take a standard collection of instructions, you can come with a certain metric called energy per instruction. So energy per add, energy per multiply, okay? That's a nice way of thinking about it, EPI, energy per instruction, okay? So ideally we want energy per instruction to go low, whatever happens. So transistor technology keeps changing, uh, Dennard's law and Moore's law are flying in different ways. Final end goal is EPI should come down. There is another metric which is a nice acronym, IPS. Uh, EPI is one, IPS is another. IPS is instructions per second. So we need to run a lot of instructions per second to maximize throughput, okay? That's another nice uh, number. So IPS can be improved by using effectively vectorization where you are doing double the work of a single instruction or by using multiple cores, you are doing multiple instructions per second. And what we get when we multiply EPI and IPS is a familiar quantity. So energy per instruction times instruction per second is energy per second. <laughs> and energy per second is wattage. <laughs> so now we have something that you can negatize. Energy per second or wattage is governed by EPI times IPS. So how do we play this uh, uh, thing, okay? So you cannot, uh, we really can drive down EPI using some good engineering and good uh, architectural design. So all the computer architects and micro architects here, yeah, you are doing <laughs> EPI reduction for us. And IPS, we had to find some good ways. And uh, I think I had a slide. Uh, yeah, so this slide. And Ed Grashowski was tracking Intel's own development of processors. And there was a point at which Intel hit a crisis. And AMD was really exceeding Intel in terms of uh, market penetration. So Intel's Israel design team was handed a certain project to do microarchitecture design. So they came with this Sibanius microarchitecture. And then Intel produced the Centrino brand of computers. And Ed Grosowski went and measured its uh, EPI. And he found that its EPI was very, very low. It was well architected. And that rescued Intel in terms of. Uh, so what happens is if you design simpler cores with less depth in pipelining, OK, uh, then, and uh, less complexity of the forwarding logic, the energy per instruction goes down. Uh, th that's what uh, you, you get. If you, the idea of designing a deep pipeline is to milk as much instruction level parallelism, but instruction level parallelism is a function of the code you run. So some code don't have parallelism. So if you build a long pipeline in the hope of ILP, and if you don't get ILP, then you're just burning energy. So the EPS is a delicate quantity. So there the guideline is simpler cores, the better e e EPI, okay? So multi-core is really simple EPI because simple cores and lots of cores, so you get a lot, uh, larger IPS. So that's how the microprocessor's uh, uh, balance worked out. You get, so for the same amount of instructions uh, overall executed at a lower wattage, you can uh, get uh, advantage with multi-core, provided you can use all the cores. So that's one reason why this pen, humble pen that I'm holding, <laughs> writing on my iPad, uh, has uh, two cores. <laughs> Why should this have a multi-core, okay? That's the reason. It uses the core smartly, the battery energy. So I think there's always a reason to have multi-cores uh, in a product. And uh, cell phones have this kind of an uh, internal architecture. Lots of different cores, and all of them um, helping simplify its own design, so lower EPI, and then to total IPS goes up. But the problem, headache is clear. <laughs> 
and the kind of work that you had to execute for different stages of the computer are different. Some of them are throughput compute, so you need GPU-like machines. Some of them are reactive compute for uh, processing network packets, so you define a des diff design a different core. So you have different uh, six different instruction sets you have to deal with, seven different parallel programming models. This is from Sarita Adwe, an incompatible memory system. So multi-core is a game of shifting <laughs> the burden from hardware designed to uh, onto the programmer's shoulder. Pro programmers are now uh, will have to program machines uh, under a very complex model. Okay, so no free lunch in terms of aut aut automatic ILP extraction. You have to program the parallelism, then you get higher IPS. Uh, you have to deal with the message shipping and all that. So it's very clear that multi-core and uh, parallel computing is not simple, clean, Software engineering like Dijkstra and Hoare and Nuth and all the olden day figures in software engineering used to do. They used to say single entry, single fun, uh, exit, no side effect free, clean programs, okay? The world has opened up. We can't live with this world, that's clear. We have to make the software complexity go down. So a lot of this course is going to be on software complexity, unfortunately. It is a hard world where a lot of things are either trying to take away correctness and introduce bugs or try to take away performance and introduce nasty realities. So, and that's what I'm here to teach you because I really worry about low level things not getting taken care of properly before we start building castles in the sky. <laughs> You may end up creating one or two castles and um, dazzle everybody and fire up one big program and say, boom. But when you go back to your uh, desks, what do you see? Uh, not in, in any of that. <laughs> so I'm going to try and show you a lot of the uh, diligence it takes to get the correctness engineered and the performance engineered a, a lot in small piece of code. Experts from companies are coming in to do the building large castles. We'll, we'll have more to talk about things, okay? So, so this is a statistic from IBM Power9. So let us see where we are now. So anybody who remembered old microprocessors and used to enjoy them and uh, think about them as simple uh, jewels are in for a surprise. So this is IBM's latest uh, chip, which far exceeds uh, the industries, uh, uh, many other industries. Four gigahertz, so IBM didn't attempt to put a higher clock rate. Four gigahertz it is, it's a hard stopping point almost. Don't uh, clock faster. Lots of parallelism means you can clock slower and still get enough work done, that's the general idea. Feature size, 14 nanometer FinFET, um, they can put about eight to 10 billion transistors. These are all very, very important facts because we live and die by the way the technology moves. So. 14 nanometer is the feature size, minimum feature size. That means that somewhere in the chip you will find a 14 minute nanometer component, okay? It doesn't mean that everything is 14 nanometer. Wire spacing and a lot of the features are different. It used to be that this number was the single number that told you how big a, a chip was long ago. But these days, it, they apply a marketing game whereby they advertise the smallest realizable feature right there. <laughs> the rest hasn't shrunk as much. So 14 nanometer, seven nanometer stepping doesn't mean that the chip sides will become half and the chip will pay, pack, uh, have one fourth of the area for the same transistors. No way, that scaling doesn't work. <laughs> it is, uh, has to be diluted with a scaling factor. This, these are all things that uh, are important to know because you see, I, I personally was bitten by a surprise. Going from 14 to seven is a hard act because the lithography costs are going to skyrocket. These fabs are very expensive. Seven, eight billion dollars is the cost I've heard. And going to close to a nanometer is going to cost, cost a lot of laser technology and the fab lith masking technology to change. We are really not there. Actually, the Dutch companies are doing extremely well there. ASML, I think, is a company they, if you go to the Netherlands, uh, I, which I was last year, you will see a lot of enthusiasm <laughs> there in terms of basic technology, and they're really eating the lunch. They're basic fab technologies and lasers, ASML is, uh, I think uh, that's the right acronym. acronym. So fab technology is not going to arbitrarily step down. There's a big cost. But look at the cores. They have 12 simultaneously multi-threaded, uh, eight-way multi-threaded. So you have 12 cores. Each core can support eight 
threads, software threads, in a sense. That's because the functional units of the cores have been split up to carry out the work of eight different threads running through them. There are some functional units that get shared and multiplied, so you don't get the benefit of eight way, eight truly true cores. So effectively, so how do, how do you know this number? So today we can do this experiment, okay? So or even coming days. Run the htop command. Anybody heard of the htop command? Okay. Run the htop command whenever you have these experiments and run your uh, number of threads going up and all that. <laughs> and then see what's the number of uh, threads that are able to be supported by uh, the software. So th that will tell you the hardware threads, the number of hardware threads. So you really see not just the cores, but the degree of multi-threading also show up by the htop command. But anyway, uh, you can see the emphasis of multi-cores having pinned a microprocessor um, to this corner of having lots of cores with the threading allowed. So now that you have this many hardware threads, it is important that you exploit it. So you have to, you have three choices, let us say, just to simplify life. You can write all the p-threads code you want and you get the 96 uh, threads uh, launched. And we will see that writing p-threads code is a lot of fun, a lot of uh, detailed work, <laughs> and ultimately very dangerous. But we are going to try and write some p-thread code or examine some p-thread code because then only you will appreciate what lies uh, above it, which could be OpenMP or threading building block. So we might use, uh, we will illustrate OpenMP to some extent because OpenMP is one of the gold standards of parallel computing that's uh, catching on. We definitely need to understand Intel's threading building block as one example, just because uh, it's one of the very well designed uh, threading libraries designed by the top designers at Intel, Arch Robinson and so on. And it uses modern C++. Uh, just to show of hands, I'm not a great C++ programmer, but I aspire to be one. <laughs> uh, how many of you enjoy coding in C++? Okay, so if you are there, okay, good. But C++ has become a wonderful language starting from C++11, going to C++14, and now C++17 and 20. It's not the same old C++ as before. We have, for instance, uh, the Lambda feature in C++, which was found only in functional programming languages. So you can actually write a little pure function as a Lambda and then map it over a list. There are extremely short coding idioms. And HPC is going to take on C++ very, very drastically. So it's a good time to be a good C++ programmer. In fact, any of my students who get a job at NVIDIA or companies like that, they undergo two, three weeks of intense C++ uh, training, even though they are already good in C++. They really are brought to a certain level of maturity, NVIDIA. So it's, it's, it's actually pros and cons exist, but uh, C++ is going to be important. And Intel threading building block is one language where C++ shines. OpenMP was used initially as a basic mechanism to lift C code or Fortran code. Any, anyone who writes Fortran code here? No, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Fortran is widely used. Uh, a lot of atmospheric simulation code is in Fortran. And Fortran apparently has become very uh, good in terms of its linguistic features. But, and it's still an important language. So, so C and Fortran have been lifted uh, through OpenMP annotations, but now OpenMP is uh, getting ready to embrace C++ atomics and things like that. So there is a now a C++ standard out there. And uh, my colleague, uh, Steve Siegel from University of Delaware and me to some extent, we looked at the document in terms of the synchronization commands. We gave them feedback. We are kind of aware of. So I just brought it up because the technologies that are going to help us move forward in the software world are getting ready to exploit the hardware of this kind. The other kind, the other observation is, my goodness, the cache sizes. I had no good recollection of uh, cache sizes, uh, but I never knew caches being this large. <laughs> and L1 cache itself is uh, 64 kilobytes, and L2, 512 kilobytes, and 120 megabytes, come on. <laughs> Uh, and you have to keep the caches happy, otherwise the performance tanks. Uh, as soon as the, you're using, abusing your locality of performance, there is nothing that uh, makes your code uh, run fast anymore. Even though you have the, all, all the parallelism in the world, without locality, your code just runs 
extremely slow like a bullet cart. So, so the basics are hidden here. The locality of code, and we'll have some hands-on that you can do to see its locality. But so multi-core, uh, what I'm realizing, and my research colleagues at the University of are much more ahead of me, but I'm still realizing it equally, is that parallel computing is not about cores. It's largely about memory. <laughs> memory systems and the heaping memory access going. And GPUs are there because they are wonderful at handling memory. What does a GPU thread do when it uh, hits a point where the memory stall happens? It just switches to another thread and runs it. It hides the whole latency. So the throughput computing model is there because GPUs addressed all the problems that multi-cores faced, but in a very foresightful way, leapfrogging generations of thinking such that when all the community has been trained up to think parallel, well, the GPU hardware is ready <laughs> for them. So I think there is a nice uh, uh, vision there, and all these simple parts, local communication, because wiring is an expensive thing in a computer. Wires consume energy. So GPUs have everything that I said about uh, as being a problem addressed well. Then our scaling, Moore's law, all these things are favorable to GPUs. Yeah. So heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is meaning you have some GPUs, some CPUs, some FPGA. Are we going to have FPGA? There is one person who could have covered, he was going to, right? We cut short the time. We might talk about FPGA <laughs> anecdotally, but FPGAs are being viewed as an interesting because Intel bought a large company and all that. So, so how is uh, the world evolving? So hyper-threaded CPUs, uh, multi-threaded CPUs, supporting OpenMP, GPUs, these are all going to be central. But this can all spread only so much. These uh, shared memory parallelism can hold only so much compute. And there is a reason for that. The main reason is cache coherency, okay, cache coherency. So we need to understand what prevents us from going arbitrarily 2,000 way or 20,000 way multi-core. Cache coherency. What's cache coherency? Cache coherency is the view of seeing a homogeneous memory space where for each address you have a single latest value. <laughs> How is that magic arranged? <laughs> That's the real thing. The magic is as soon as a core writes uh, into a location, in effect, that location's uh, validity is uh, gone in other cores. It invalidates it somehow. So it could be invalidate, update, update everything else. So there is a notion of a single latest value. So for that single address, you should have the latest value. So that's notion of coherence. I'll have a lot to say about coherence later. Coherence is hard. So again, my own personal experience is limited, but I did a sabbatical at Intel where they were designing uh, the QPI protocol. QPI is, uh, is uh, what is uh, used in today's Intel multi-core. It's a very, very complex message passing protocol underneath in hardware. That message passing is needed to invalidate other caches, uh, ship the latest copy, all this within nanoseconds. So the instructions are pounding and the last level cache is suffering misses, but when a cache misses, you have to invalidate the, um, you have to get the data from the latest cache. You can't have two uh, copies like 20 and 40, uh, value 20 and value 40, claiming to be the latest value of a single address. No, there has to be only a single latest value. So that is arranged through a complex message passing network in hardware. So you might write MPI programs. <laughs> this is all probably known to you, but let me say it in a dramatic way, as if you didn't know. <laughs> MPA programs, but MPA programs then use multi-cores. Multi-cores run in shared memory, but the shared memory is implemented by hardware cache coherency message passing underneath. There are about 80 or 90 messages. Nobody knows what those messages are, but they are coherency messages. It's a very complex uh, engineering exercise to get coherence right. If you get, make even one mistake in cache coherence, you cannot sell a microprocessor. And companies have delayed their microprocessor shipment because of cache coherency bugs. So, the idea is that the more cores you want to be in a coherence domain, like all these 40,000 cores had to have the single latest copy, the cache coherency protocol has to be even more complex just to hide the latencies. You can't do that. So at some point you say, enough is enough. This cache coherency protocol is all I can debug within my limited time. So that tells you this many cores can be put and this many GPUs. But that number has been shifting. 
I hear from my colleagues at Livermore, Lawrence Livermore Lab, that uh, today one of the high-end computers may have 2,000, 3,000 nodes which exchange MPI messages. And within each of these nodes, a lot of hyper-threaded cores and GPUs are going to do the shared memory parallel computing. It used to be that people thought there could be lots of little cores, like a million cores, all doing message passing. That's not happening. Smaller number of chunkier cores. But still, the chunkiness has not grown disproportionately. There is a stopping point. And GPUs have come in and said, uh, we dilute the memory ordering a little bit. So GPUs are not as worried about coherence in many cases. I can tell you more about that. So GPUs have relaxed the memory consistency views a lot, and their design is much simpler. So, and then who, what is the languages used? The languages used are MPI for the highest level, but there are noticeable exceptions happening. A lot of the high performance computing code at Lawrence Berkeley Lab is being written in a language called Unified Parallel C. So it looks like C. It has strong and weak variables. So if you write into a weak variable, uh, that variable's update is not known to the other nodes right away. But under the covers, there's a message passing that's going on that makes uh, the variable update happen gradually. And then strong variables are a point at which all the weak updates so far must be caught up. So it's kind of a clever design of message passing under the hood of C. They have it for Java also. This is a language called Julia, which uh, is being pioneered. And uh, recently, there was a project uh, from MIT and uh, Julia Compute Corporation where they developed a Periscale software system in all in Julia. And I was at the talk. It's a very impressive. So engineering-wise, Julia code looks extremely elegant, easy to debug. But others have to build the debugging ecosystem and all that. They were doing it for star tracking. So if you want to plot the sky map and see which are the objects that are not moving, which are meteorites and all that, there is a way in which you can observe the sky data over several months or years, do machine learning to find out which are stars. <laughs> So they actually are discovering lots of stars uh, by software and machine learning these days. I mean, humans cannot look at it anymore. And the Julia code is doing all the work. It's a very impressive project here. So uh, uh, I think uh, I'll continue. What slide number am I? OK. I don't put slide numbers. Just to keep you <laughs> thinking is not a short, long talk. OK, I'm sort of, uh, I, I'll disappoint you by saying, <laughs> I have a lot of material. <laughs> but let, let me go. Let, let me see. Okay. So if, if you have any questions, thoughts, uh, jump at uh, it and uh, ask questions anytime. Any questions so far? Any discussions? Or should, I, should I stop and discuss any topic? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Can you explain the architecture of IPM processor and the physical Yeah. Two Okay. And this IBM has a different architecture. OK. As well as different memory models used for HPC. OK. Because we are talking about the shared memory processor. OK. Shared memory architecture. So I can so definitely address uh, so shared memory models in two different senses, but uh, not now. I am making notes on it. OK. But Intel versus IBM, I have fairly high level understanding. It is. Uh, uh, material that is evolving fast. We can talk about it offline. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I know certain aspects of Intel processors and certain aspects of Intel, uh, IBM processors. Intel processors are drastically different because, of course, they hold on to the old x86 model. Correct. So they immediately have UOPS, that is uh, live translation of the higher level instructions to UOPS. In fact, the things can be read from the internet, but how these are impacting when you buy a machine. Ah, I see, I see. So how the code will run on the I Intel see, platform see, see, as well see. as on the IBM platform. Will it be any I benefit see. to buy Power 9 series? Oh, I see, I see. That uh, I'd like to consult uh, others and uh, tell you. But commodity software-wise, um, software tooling-wise, Intel has several yeah, advantages. It's uh, yeah. So for instance, binary instrumentation. As soon as you come to binary instrumentation, do any act of performance monitoring or correctness monitoring, Intel has the tool called PIN. 
and IBM doesn't have an equivalent of pin. So that's, for debugging engineers, that's a big worry problem. Yeah. Where's the engineering? Yeah, that's the engineering yeah. aspect. Commodity and buying wise, you will have to go with the uh, whole charges, you will listen to the objectives you are trying to meet. Uh, I really don't have a good answer. IBM compilers are its own licensing models change. In the slide, it was 12 SMK uh -huh. with H, so it becomes 96 hyperthreading machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. will there be physical 96 cores or it no, is no, no, simulated? No. It's simulated, yeah. So that, uh, the eight-way hyperthreading in 12 cores. So if you actually look at a die, you will see 12 cores, which uh, pretty much have what a core is supposed to have but uh, the execution units have uh, internal parallelism. So one so has to enable. Yeah, one so to one enable. has to enable eight thread context. So the fact that eight threads are running means that you had to maintain the uh, associated registers uh, okay. for the eight threads. Okay. Uh, and the functional units had to be multiplexed to be conflict free and things like that, yeah. So I don't know how they have mastered uh, this higher degree. I think Intel's uh, numbers are lower. I have seen a presentation by Akhilesh Kumar, who is the lead, ar lead architect of Skylake. He was at Utah and he gave a talk. Intel Skylake is very interesting. <laughs> um, the, but the numbers quoted in that aspect are lower. But I don't know anything about the amount of uh, impact it has on an end user, but my thinking is it's, it's a very deep question. Okay, thank I you. Can only, yeah, I can only tell you certain things. Like even when we try to run a certain number of nodes, uh, in Intel tasks in the supercomputer, we say, okay, this uh, supercomputing center is not licensed to launch this many copies of the Intel compiler. <laughs> this is the limit, you know, so you have to pay the, the manufacturer certain licensing fee yeah. even to launch uh, compilers uh, up to a certain degree. So, yeah, so I think performance is one aspect and uh, the commercial end of the angle ecosystem of software. ARM is another big player. ARM account research is uh, going big time in terms of uh, core adoption. So there are some, Barcelona Supercomputing Center is building an entirely ARM-based supercomputer. I think the thinking is that ARM is going to be a lead player. Uh, they have conquered a lot of uh, problems. Shared memory, I mean, memory models, okay. So the term gets used in two different ways and uh, I'm sure you are all experts in the general notion of memory models, which is the memory organizational model, okay? I, we can talk about it. How is the memory organized? Is there a notion of, a, like in GPU, is there a notion of a shared memory address space where all the threads uh, in a thread block are able to quickly communicate? Is it a global memory? That's the organization. Memory consistency model means uh, when you write a piece of memory in, one processor, how quickly are these effects notified to another processor? Or are, are they automatically notified? Do you use, have to use a fence instruction to push out the accesses? That's a memory consistency model. Quickly said, they sound like memory model, okay? <laughs> memory model, but uh, memory model is memory consistency model or memory organization model, and they are different. I'm kind of a mini expert in memory consistency models because I have tracked the pros and cons. So when it comes to programming, uh, we can talk about memory consistency models. Um, we, we'll have occasion to talk about that. Thank you, this is a good uh, interlude. I like questions like this, which takes me into a territory where I'm scratching my head and uh, saying things which I didn't plan for, which is fun, okay? Everybody has, uh, I like, uh, and I, I will get back with as many details, okay. All right, so we'll have fun uh, things to talk about. Um, this is a nice uh, visual that uh, my colleague at Livermore put together saying, how do we address the productivity crisis? This is because we had to train a lot of people to be engineers who write good software. They had to do engineering right and software design right. So they are now going to be dealing with CPUs, GPUs, FPGA, but the memory types are also growing. You have uh, flash memories of various kinds, phase change memories, and uh, non-volatile RAMs. It's, it's a complex uh, memory space, which I don't track that well, but one likes to use all that. Scales are growing, problem sizes and threads. The behaviors are going to be interesting. I will have occasion to show that. This is kind of high level, so you can flash through it later. I'm leaving fly, uh, slides online. So there, is a, there are a lot of things that uh, are going to affect us. Let me see, in the interest of time, let me see if they have a nice component coming 
and I will focus my time on that. Okay. Everything is interesting, that is a problem, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, we have a uh, this is session 2, I have another this is session 1, there is another talk. Let me see how far I get and skip over slides uh, when necessary, but unfortunately a lot of these slides are all important. I am willing to slip over, skip over. And well, that is a nice picture from Hawaii. That's not what. <laughs> okay, this is uh, this is something I like to skip over. Okay, this is this is an interesting slide because uh, it's a direction that companies uh, and organizations are going to take increasingly in future. So the idea is that today's parallel code is created with a lot of effort, and as soon as that effort is expended and the software has been tuned the available hardware technologies have changed. So you have different types of GPUs, or more proportion of GPUs, or FPGAs. Should we rewrite all the code? That's a huge uh, problem where the analog of that doesn't exist in the enterprise compute world, throughput transaction-oriented world. So in HPC, all these codes are tightly coupled or helping together uh, solve a problem. So they have this uh, automatic converter, if you will, where you can take existing code and write annotations around its uh, usage of memory, uh, write annotations around its uh, loop structures, and then send it through the COCOS system, and it, it uh, reproportions the use of multi cores, many cores, CPU, GPU. That's a general idea. So it's kind of an intermediate layer that helps port today's software for tomorrow's hardware uh, with less effort than total rewrite of the code. And this is a problem, and people are working on solutions to make software's usefulness last across hardware generations. This is, is a effort to which uh, there is a similar effort called RAJA, R-A-J-A. It's uh, an acronym which is four authors' names at uh, Livermore. Yeah, uh, this is on correctness and productivity. Uh, the main point is, uh, I will address these points. Reliability is a hu huge issue, reliability of compute units. If you work on HPC, you have to worry about the computations giving the same answer, the same answer when run twice. Even if the code is a deterministic piece of code, you, uh, you may sur be surprised that two different executions produce two different answers, and that is kind of difficult to deal with. Uh, lower level effects such as uh, hardware bit flips exist. I'm not going to talk about that. Alpha particles striking transistors momentarily can flip the sense of the transistor or a stored location. That's a big worry. Uh, we have some solutions in the development. People have observed that turning off uh, ECC protection on memories uh, boosts performance by 20%, and some GPUs have used that trick to turn off ECC error correction. And for soft applications, you get a ready boost. but how much do you push these things is a challenge. Floating point precision is another area we work in, uh, and I will have an uh, opportunity to mention that. The normal floating point words are 32-bit or 64-bit, called single precision or double precision, but NVIDIA is now coming up with half precision, which is 16-bit precision. And at first glance, it's great, 16 bits, so you can have two 16 bits, uh, and so double the utilization of my cache. Okay, caches are a big uh, expensive resource, so I can't use double. The problem is 16 bit words have two problems. One is, uh, I'll have in the afternoon lecture. Floating point word is a sine bit exp uh, mantis and exponent, not arranged that way, it's sine exponent mantis. Uh, but the dynamic range of numbers, the min and max values, the interval between min and max values grows shorter with 16-bit. So you may fall off the end <laughs> and come into the NAND territory, not a number. So overflow equivalent is not a number, it just goes. The other is the grain size of numbers uh, changes. So you may not, you may get higher round off. We'll talk about that in the afternoon. But these are all things that are happening the high level. 
Debugging, how is debugging happening and uh, in the field? So if you are all really going to be in HPC and uh, stay with it for some years, you will find debugging is uh, not very well supported uh, in many cases. Uh, for most users who get standard codes and uh, run on standard clusters and want to reproduce or create similar results, it's not a huge problem, I would say, although things could be bigger, uh, to, to, to could be better. But in the industry and at high level, we have observed uh, when we wrote this report that was mentioned. So we wrote a report of HPC correctness uh, uh, submitted to DOE and uh, I'm alphabetically first, I should be here otherwise. <laughs> but uh, it's a report that really we brainstormed for two uh, days and we exchanged email for six months and put together a study. And we said, what's the reality out there? Are people having uh, encountering problems uh, in terms of debugging? And uh, surprisingly, we found that uh, this is happening. Ba um, bag bugs in parallel molecular dynamics code. People don't talk about bugs. Uh, People talk about the good results after the bug, but uh, it, have, it wastes people's times. Um, hangs in larger codes. Um, people have to use printf's finally, okay? Uh, how do you know when, uh, the final thing is, I think there's a mini experience here. We made debug sitting happily on our multi-core interact. As soon as you submit on a batch system, we just sit and pray. <laughs> it may come with a divide by zero. And uh, that's a small example, but sometimes uh, it may, it may not even produce a core dump. Some processors don't allow you to core dump gracefully. So when you get a job not finished, uh, it's a problem. It's an opportunity wasted. Uh, some of the projects allocate these uh, compute resources with a lot of thoughts. They write to NSF saying, I want this many million, uh, 20 million CPU hours, core hours. That's nothing for them. <laughs> they may want to run a job at 2 million, uh, 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 what's the largest, uh, 200 million Cores have been run by my colleague Martin Burzin. So for him, the core hour allocation is huge. <laughs> so as soon as you hit such a number, you worry a lot. So debugging through printfs is not what we want. We want something much better that finds bugs early. This is this is interesting. Okay, uh, this is just a one one in a thousand year kind of a bug, but uh, it happened. <laughs> so maybe maybe not the so my colleague, uh, Martin Berzins, and my former undergrad researcher who became his PhD student, Alan Humphrey, and another PhD student, they had a piece of MPI code that was running on Xeon systems, talking on MPI. And no problem, the code was trusted and uh, delivered results. When Xeon Phi came on the horizon, they shipped some of the compute to happen on Xeon Phi. As soon as they did that, the, code, the whole code deadlocked. And they took about two weeks to find out why it deadlocked. <laughs> and finally they found that in one place they were computing a number of messages to be sent and received by this P by C ratio for these numbers. Uh, if you can read this quickly, you can type this uh, quickly and uh, write in Python. <laughs> if you don't want to, <laughs> that's fine. But you will get uh, uh, 161 as the answer after a uh, correct uh, Rounding down, uh, rounding, I think. Yeah, 161.999. <laughs> yeah. But in Xeon Phi, it uh, rounded to 162. So now this was uh, run in MPI symmetric mode where it was doing MPI send of P by C messages. MPI receive of P by C messages and mismatched. And it depends on which way the mismatch occurs. If the mismatch had been, I expect 162 messages, I am sending 161. And if you had a buffer of 162, no problem. The code would have run fine and the bug would not have been found out. But they were lucky that the sense was inverted and the code deadlocked. So I'm just saying it's, it's not a single thing that causes a bug. You had to sort of know when you compile a piece of code, what flags you are applying to optimize the code such that the answer is reliable. So there, I will be talking about floating point arithmetic this afternoon because you have to understand floating point. All real numbers are represented as floating point numbers. <laughs> and uh, most of the HPC codes deal with real numbers. <laughs> and floating point has a standard called the IEEE standard. So we'll talk a little bit about IEEE. But IEEE has a hardware standard and a software standard. And software standard has IEEE safe flags, which give you nice behaviors. But IEEE unsafe flags are sometimes two, three times faster. <laughs> so
So sometimes you may use an IEEE unsafe flag. Boom, the answer can change. So there are a lot of uh, dangers in delicate situations when it comes to floating point. So again, I'm telling you in this course, uh, it's performance at the right level of reliability. So I will delve into this floating point, and I have a lot. So if you if you want to talk about, uh, if you want to ask me questions, I'll tell you which favorite questions I have. <laughs> you can ask any of those questions. I can answer them gleefully for hours and hours. But uh, do ask anything else, okay? But floating point is one of my many passions, <laughs> okay? In terms of understanding how it works, okay? Portability is a huge headache. Performance portability is a huge headache. This is again bad. Not correctness portability, but performance portability. Yeah. My primary training is in formal methods. I'll be honest. I didn't want to be, or uh, not want to be, but a bargain to be in HPC. I ended up being here. But I have been a person who has uh, developed uh, verification methods, and uh, HPC is a good target. Okay. So let's. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Let us quickly step through it, but it's important. Do you know about an Intel Pentium bug? Anyone here? Okay, it's good to talk about it because it has happened, and we shouldn't allow these kinds of bugs to happen again. Uh, around 1995, Pentium, uh, Pentium came out as the flagship processor, and it had really incredible properties. So if I actually had a number A, which is a full whole number, okay, no fractions, and the B, which is this whole number, and this is basically A minus B times A by B. Arithmetic tells us it should be zero, <laughs> but Intel produced 256. And it is not explainable by any floating point rounding. We know that floating point rounding happens. So even if you take Python or spreadsheet and type 10 by 3, what do you get? 3.3333, right? Act like that. So a lot of funny things in Excel. I can show you a lot of funny things in Excel. There's one thing in Excel where if you write a formula, it gives you a value. And not to put down Excel, but it, it's kind of a difficult problem for many people, I assure you. If you write a certain expression, it gives you a certain answer in Excel. I can show you this afternoon. If you put just parentheses outside, just parentheses outside, the answer changes. And sometimes you people think it's a cleanup of the numbers that Excel, Microsoft is doing. Internal representation may be the same, but you can actually deep test it with an if expression. Uh, they are different internally, bitwise different. So there are these ad hoc rounding that some programs have used. It's dangerous. It's not good for the public to suddenly have Excel. And br uh, conditionals can branch differently based on that rounding. But this is even exceeding that. This is not rounding. What this was is a hardware bug. Intel Pentium had a hardware bug. Uh, they had a division error. So subsequently, Intel cleaned up entire production chain and made uh, arithmetic very reliable. This is history, but it's an important piece of history. This is why hardware is reliable. My, my laptop, your laptop works correctly. It doesn't crash that often because formal methods have gone into it in two critical places. Which are those two places? Floating point arithmetic and cache coherence. I told you already about cache coherence being hard and difficult. You can't have a cache coherency bug. Formal methods, the most advanced kind of debugging methods based on mathematical logic, <coughs> at least to some extent, are being used in cache coherency. Floating point, even more mathematical methods. Uh, so we should have some of that mentality in software is what I'm thinking. <coughs> okay, so I think we'll have 15 minutes. What am I going to lecture on? This is a rough pattern I have planned. <coughs> Today it's basics. So I have talked about a lot of the basic basics so far. I think in the 15 minutes I'll have some more nuggets. It's not over yet. <laughs> you can stand and stretch. <laughs> in 10 minutes I'll be 15 minutes, okay? Tomorrow it's going to be p-threads. We have to start with p-threads and see how difficult it can be. Then OpenMP is somehow going to be fitted in. We'll see how the timing works out. <laughs> there may be spillover. Then comes <coughs> two days of lectures by Intel and NVIDIA folks. Then Friday I'll pick up uh, thread building blocks, MPI, and frameworks. Frameworks is a place where we should be.
and I will expose you to one framework. It's only about 400 or 500 lines of code, so we can even try to read the entire framework. <laughs> Just to know what a framework contains. This is a, a nicely crafted framework for uh, parallel search, like traveling salesman problem or optimization. And that framework is written by one of the expert coders, Martin Bircher, I work with him. He has uh, arranged it so that you can parameterize it at this many MPI, this much open MP, this much GPU. It's a nice uh, thing to study. It's a specialized framework. Um, so frameworks are things that either hide the complexity or even generate code for you. The way the world is going now, people are even writing Python code, specialized dialects of Python. And they generate MPI, TBB, open MPP threads underneath. So push a button, it writes MPI code for you. That's the best of the both, best of all worlds. We should be there. And people are slowly working towards it. But of course, uh, it's good to understand how to even trust those frameworks, because sometimes those frameworks can be buggy. We need to know how to debug, and they don't do the right thing. Plus, we need to know what it takes to get there. So we should be covering some of the basics. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. For instance, we have to write a piece of code in pthreads where we keep allocating threads and see what happens. Okay? And if you don't do the right checks, there are only two options. One is the OS says no more threads, and if you don't test the condition, core, uh, you get a core dump. It may happen, but if you write the program with some more awareness, you can now take a decision saying, after this many threads, I'm going to go serial. <laughs> Since there are no more threads, why don't I compute serially? All that work is now encapsulated into OpenMP and TBB, which does it for you. <laughs> it doesn't uh, exceed the number of threads, and it doesn't tie on you. But it took some time to create that, so we'll have some exercises of that kind. Yeah. I think I have 15 minutes, so let me blast through and uh, see how it happens. So we should talk about performance. So this is one of the juicier topics for the morning. Amdahl's law and Gustafson's law, strong and weak scaling, work span parallelism, parallel programming models, debugging performance tuning patterns. Let's try to get through this. I'm not trying to rush on you, but uh, we may continue a little bit of it afterwards, but let us hit on the highlights, okay? So performance is the way we are here in terms of performance. So multi-course arrival already covered. Amdahl observed in the late 70s that uh, if a program has a fraction P that is parallel, like 60% parallel and one by P, which is 40% serial, points uh, four serial. Then at the first approximation, if you have N processors, you can beat down the fraction to P by N for the parallel part. The serial part remains serial. It's still approximate uh, as an analysis. You can, the mindset is that the parallel code is arbitrary and anywhere it can be chopped into pieces. I should, I should connect my iPad and write on it, and I can project all this, but I'll do that experiment in the afternoon, okay? I usually teach using iPad and write live notes on PDF, and I add pages. I love the uh, medium there, and I record and upload my YouTube and all that. So as n tends to infinity, the speed up you will get is uh, you can calculate uh, that easily. I can show the derivation in a second, but uh, basically if you, um, had a original uh, time uh, p and uh, one minus p, uh, it is going to be p plus one minus p, which is one, that's the total. And now in the parallel situation, it is going to be one minus p plus uh, p by n. And then, uh, so that p by n factor is there. If you set n to infinity, that p by n dissolves and becomes zero. So that's how it simplifies to one by one minus p. So example, if the program has half the serial code, um, in the numerator, it will have one. Uh, 0.5 plus one minus 0.5 is one. In the denominator, you will have 0.5 plus 0.5 by n. And that uh, n tends to infinity, that 0.5 by n becomes zero, so you get twice. So this is simple, uh, and it predicts. So. But then people got started worrying about this uh, scary math thing. Oh, if I have half my code serial, I'll get only twice as fast, <laughs> even if I throw in an infinite number of processors. So 
why go parallel, okay? <laughs> this is the 70s thinking, simple calculation. And uh, anyway, the hardware was not ready, so it's a good excuse to put off parallelizing. Say, hey, it's not worth going there because you get only twice the speed up, even if you have an infinite number of processors. So let's not do it, okay? That's the strong scaling. These experiments are still done today. So if you take a problem, fix the problem size, and keep adding cores, we can do that experiment easily and plot a curve. We will get a strong scaling curve. And after some value, it will stop increasing. And after some value, it will start decreasing also. Just because more throwing more threads and making them active will add to the overhead. It will pull down. But that is the strong scaling graph which we can plot. Gustafson's observation, <coughs> uh, he, these are the uh, gentlemen we are talking about, <coughs> is that, no, the problems don't get uh, fixed in size. As you advance in computing, the problems are getting larger. Today you're solving a small problem, tomorrow it'll be a million by million uh, mesh you're solving on, things like that, large graphs. So can we get another figure of merit where we can increase the problem size and grow the processors also? That's called weak scaling. So weak scaling graphs are plotted by basically having uh, the problem size as one parameter and the processors or the cores as the other, and then the speed up. So how much speed up can you get as you increase the problem? These are very important understandings we should have. We will revisit it as needed. Modern views are kind of different. Modern view of computation is to view work in terms of work and span. How, are, how many activities do you need to get completed? And what's the critical path? So this is a good diagram. So let us say that uh, all computes are not serial parallel where the parallel can be sh shaved off entirely but rather the computes are organized, computational units are organized as one activity A has to finish, one has to finish before two finish starts. When two starts, three and 13 can be started in parallel, et cetera, et cetera. So this dependence graph is a better model for parallelism because even when you make a, if five people are asked to uh, arrange a bed or something, <laughs> some people can be stuffing the pillow, some people can be um, dusting the, bed sheet uh, in parallel and then, then there comes, comes a place where they have to contend for the bed sheet be put before the pillow, not the other way, so there is a serial bottleneck. So finally it's all parallel and serial, right? Even cooking wise, uh, you can't, five cooks can't cook five, five times faster, there is some serial, serialization point. So this critical path is important because that sort of tells you when the job gets done. <laughs> so there are two numbers here, one is called the work, Work is the total count of the number of nodes, 18 nodes, 18 units of work. That is the T1, T's of one, which is if you have one processor, you will take 18 units of time. Is that clear? <laughs> you step through and finish. You can't, of course, start here. You have to do that. But once you do that and do that, you can do that and that, and then six, like that. Some bread first order, okay? Some bread first order can be used. So 18 units of time later, you're done. Then you have span is the nine, that's a critical path distance. You can count one, uh, nine nodes in the yellow. That's called T infinity. Because if you have an inf infinite number of processors, <laughs> while this is going on, you can be eating up the, side, the sides in parallel. So the side branches that are not in the critical path don't count. That's called T infinity. So speed up is defined to be T1 by TP for P processors. That's the speed up figure we like because I had one processor or one core or one active thread. Now I have P of them. I just get a speed up of T1 by TP. That's the speed up number. Set it aside. There's another number called T1 by T infinity. So when P equal to infinity, you can say T1 by T infinity. That's called the degree of parallelism. And speed up can never exceed the degree of parallelism. That's clear, right? Because you can't have peace. Peace of finite number infinity is infinity, yeah. This is a very important point. This tells us how 
certain algorithms cannot be made parallel no matter how you try. So this is kind of a good melting pot of all ideas. Amdahl's and Gustafsson's are present in one setting in the work span model. How? After four or five pages of solving recurrence equations, I can show you where it is. For a certain parallel merge sort, certain algorithm parallel merge sort, you all heard of merge sort, heap sort, bubble sort, right? Yeah, parallel merge sort. The speed up, the optimal speed up, uh, optimal speed up is uh, n by log square n. I think it's also the, the degree of parallelism. I don't know wh where this came from, but it's either the degree of parallelism or the, or the degree of parallelism, I would say, because it's a t1 by t infinity figure that I'm looking at. Sorry. Yeah, degree of parallelism, yeah. So degree of parallelism is, yeah, let us look at it. Degree of parallelism is uh, t1 by t infinity. And uh, how do you calculate t1 by t infinity? By actually analyzing an, an algorithm, pretty much uh, like we used to do algorithm analysis by looking at the number of recursion levels and the amount of work. But I can present some of the details later uh, from the book by Robison and McCool. But the general idea is that you can analyze an algorithm to see how many computational steps are involved and you can get that as a function of n, order of n, okay? The, using the um, big O n notation. T infinity also can be found out by solving a certain recurrence. So they set it up as a mathematical recurrence and solve it. But if you do that analysis for a certain flavor of merge sort, which is what I'm showing in, uh, in the interest of time, you will get t1 by t infinity to be n. So n items are to be, the rough idea is that in merge sort, n items are being sorted. And if you count the number of operations, elementary operations involved in merge sort, it is basically the order of n amount of work is being done, which is t1. And the depth or the critical path in that merge sort algorithm is because you have uh, uh, basically a division phase and uh, sorting the leaves and the parallel merge. There's a tree-like computation happening. The algorithm analysis there told you that uh, the span or depth, as many authors call, is log square n. So this is the theta is uh, both O and omega meet, big O notation and big omega notation uh, I agree and uh, that's the asymptotic w uh, best case so this is the expectation of the degree of parallelism in merge sort uh, that's what the derivation detail which I'm not showing shows what it says is that if you now look at the degree of parallelism in the problem which is the best possible speed up you can get the best possible speed up by plugging in some numbers here. So let us plug in 1 million. 1 million as n. And 1 million as n, when you take log to the base 2, it comes to 20. 2 raised to 20 is 1 million. And the depth or span, log square of n. So log of 20 is uh, log of uh, uh, 1 million is 20, which is already known. Uh, so 1 million is in the numerator and log is 20. So 20 times 20 is 400, which is something like 1,000, some number like that. I haven't worked out the details. So the idea is that for a million location sorting problem, the degree of parallelism for that implementation of merge sort is uh, about 1,000, which tells us that for that problem, using more than 1,000 processors is meaningless. There's only 1,000 degree parallelism. It gets bottlenecked just because the algorithm is inherently having this much work and this much depth. So one really has to analyze algorithms at this level of detail to understand the, the, the possibility to parallelize. The eye opener for quick sort, again in the same book, is kind of interesting. So my point was going to be merge sort versus quick sort. We can study the code in detail. 
we have to step through the master equation, which is a way to solve recurrences and get at the detailed math. Uh, some people already know the master's method, which is great. Algorithm analysis courses do that. That's how they do it. But for that version of parallel quick sort, the analysis for the t1 by n by t infinity, which is the work, uh, degree of parallelism, k into theta n log n by n, uh, which is basically log of n. So now for a million size problem, we get uh, 20 degree parallelism. So for this particular implementation of the algorithm, more using more than 20 processors uh, is pointless. Whereas for the other one, merge sort up to 1,000 processors was OK to use. Of course, you, if you use more processors, you don't get any benefit. You get a slowdown. So the real killer, after all is said and done, is how much degree of parallelism is there in a problem? And for that, you have to know work and the span. This is analysis. It's not easy. But whenever it's possible, we should try and esti estimate it. And um, it gives us a chance to understand. So Boolean satisfiability and problems like that are amazingly interesting to computational scientists. Because Boolean satisfiability is a single way to formulate a lot of constraint problems. But Boolean satisfiability has a humongous span. The Boolean constraint propagation is a serial algorithm. <laughs> and so the, that's, that's all I had to say, that uh, strong scaling uh, in practice work and weak scaling and strong scaling are two older terms. OK, so let me recap, since I'm out of time. Strong scaling is, more, uh, is Amdahl's law. So Amdahl's law, or strong scaling, is the derivation which I should have spent more time slides on. But basically, it is uh, uh, what is contained in the slide. 1 by uh, 1 minus p plus p by n is the speed up according to Amdahl's law. That is called the strong scaling uh, law. The weak scaling is uh, an observation by Gustafsson that you need to get uh, a degree of uh, problem size versus processors plotted. That's a weak scaling. This one tries to combine both. It tries to look at the problem not as this much serial, this much parallel, but as a graph. Then you can get degree of parallelism, and then you analyze it using whatever analysis method, and then you get a combined figure of merit. In practice, people just don't do all this math. They cannot. So they just run the application and plot it. And there, they observe that strong scaling benefits embarrassingly parallel applications, where essentially you have independent, completely independent calculations, like a map operation, where nothing needs to come together. You just map a function over it. So the more processors, the more speed up. Weak scaling is good where the problem can be decomposed and the communication costs are low. But the communication costs don't grow proportional to the problem size. That's another thing. If you have the problem size grow, but the communication grows quadratically or exponentially, then you don't get benefit in uh, weak scaling. Uh, so it's also uh, reflecting the network characteristics and the cost of the synchronizations that you use. I think that's uh, what I planned for today. Um, let's have some lunch, but <laughs> we'll have more basics today. And uh, I think I don't have too many things. Uh, OK, let me say a little bit about patterns. Uh, I don't know when I'll come back to it. The other thing I wanted to give awareness of, although I cannot fully express myself here, is uh, finally, m much like programming, is organized using programming principles uh, like recursion or divide and conquer. In parallel programming, people are working on ready patterns you can use. So you fit a problem to a pattern, then you have a sol solution for the problem in terms of the pattern. And uh, there is a nice uh, book. There are books being written on parallel programming with patterns. We can look at some of these. So. I will definitely give you one and a half hours more of a lot of interesting basics in the afternoon. And uh, they will concern floating point. They will concern weak and strong scaling and uh, many, many more things of that nature. So 
Tomorrow it will be more nuts and bolts saying, how do machines work inside TBV? How does TBV, I mean, not TBV, how does pthread work inside? How does OpenMV, okay? So thanks, so fun, yeah. While uh, saying about heterogeneity, you have give, given two programming language examples, yeah. UPC and Julia. Okay. So can you tell me for which hardware, hardware platform it, mm -hmm. is, it is being ma made, sir? Okay. Um, I just happened to pick two. Uh, they are neutral. Uh, both uh, MPI and Julia can be run on pretty much any hardware. Uh, Julia is essentially a compilation pipeline that uh, compiles it into a language intermediate form called LLVM. And LLVM is widely supported by uh, almost all hardware based on Clang technology. Then they have efficient implementations for uh, primitives. So, yeah. So but I mean CPU or GPU or uh, oh, okay, FPGA? Okay. No, no, they, they are both uh, currently for uh, s s MPI is primarily designed for CPU <coughs> as uh, the message passing, um, yeah, I guess uh, compute platform. But uh, these days GPUs are able to also perform GPU, GPU direct messaging. So there is a certain uh, CUDA set of bindings. Julia must also have GPUs. At this point, I'm not entirely clear. Yeah. It should so be there. Are those languages openly available? Yes, yes. Julia is widely available. MPI is a standard, and uh, it can it is uh, supported by companies also. Julia is uh, extremely small in terms of scale of adoption, but uh, it is growing fast in many communities. But the other languages uh, could be there were old languages like Core, Fortran, and uh, the, the, or PVM, Parallel Virtual Machines. UPC is the other. Uh, language that has higher critical mass. So if you were to rank them in terms of the usage community, it will be MPI, then UPC certainly, and Julia will be higher, uh, lower down. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.